what it is. Um, I'm going to do exactly what I said in the abstract. I'm going to teach you how to take all of that lovely data that you're pulling from all of your servers and put it into SQL, and we're going to do a do it a number of different ways, nuanced ways, show you how to get around some special problems because SQL, oddly enough, um, saving stuff to SQL sounds easy enough and it really kind of is, but it comes with its own little special problems, right? Um, <coughs> so I think I'm supposed to be following a slide deck, so I'm going to try to follow a slide deck. Oh yes, this is the vanity slide. This is the only real slide that's of any importance, so um, you can fall asleep after this. Uh, <coughs> For those of you that don't know me, I'm Sean McCown. I am a, uh, a SQL MVP and a certified master. Um, I started and I, I started and operate uh, MidnightDBA.com where we do nothing but 100% free SQL videos. I'm going to take off these glasses real quick so I can see you guys. Um, <coughs> so we do nothing but 100% free SQL Server videos. Uh, we have tons of tutorials on there. I've got like 40 or 50 PowerShell videos alone um, that take you all the way from the very basic I can't even spell PowerShell to all the way up. Um, now I can at least spell half of PowerShell. The power part, not the shell part. Um, I'm also the the principal consultant and, and probably most experienced and best consultant at Midnight SQL Consulting. There are only two of us, me and my wife, so I can say that. Um, she's the red one down there. And uh, recently, we are also Minionware Software. I'm not going to talk about that today, but you'll get to see a little bit of it if you come to my backup tuning session because we do some fabulous things with backup tuning, um, and it's all free. And uh, let's see, I think those are the important parts. So thank you for coming, and we'll see you guys later. All right, so <coughs> about this session. Um, there is so much of this, th there's so much to talk about. I really can't talk about everything you need to know about writing to SQL and all the different methods that there are in an hour and a half. I've chosen what I hope is a good overview of everything. Does everybody in here have experience with PowerShell? I hope so, no? Okay. <laughs> You're in an advanced PowerShell class. No, really. Um, and, and the thing is, is, as far as being advanced, you know, there's not really anything in this stuff that would be considered advanced, right? Um, Dr. Tobias isn't going to walk in here and go, oh my god, I've never seen that before. But what you are going to see is a lot of different methods for handling some specialized scenarios that nobody ever gets a chance to, to see. Um, in my work with Minionware, this is almost all I do anymore, is collecting data from hundreds and thousands of servers, not hundreds of thousands, that's hundreds and thousands, and literally tens of thousands of databases, and I do it several times a day. Um, so all I do is what I'm gonna show you today, and I've learned some really good tricks um, and when to do certain things one way and when to do certain things another way and how to get around different versions of SQL um, and all that type of stuff. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna start from uh, the things that you things that you should know and then things that you'd like to know. So let's go ahead and get started because I think we've got a lot to talk about and I'm gonna I've got a couple really cool things along the way. I think that is the last really big one. Yep. Y'all get bulk load rules later. We'll talk about that stuff. Okay, so is this is that still is it coming through the thing? Okay. Alrighty. Uh where to start? Where would you guys like to start? I'm jacking with you. Okay, let's start with SQL command versus invoke SQL command because this is a really important distinction for you guys to make. Um, wow, that window got small. That's better. If anybody can't see, just let me know and I'll tell you to suck it up. Okay, so let's start with the difference between uh, SQL command and invoke SQL command. So let's start with invoke SQL command, if I can find that script. I think it starts with an I. There we go. And take it easy on me a little bit. I'm a new speaker, so I don't really have my wrap down yet. What I wanted to do was show you the command. Okay, so <coughs> invoke SQL command. <coughs> this is probably the easiest thing you will ever do when saving data to SQL. Um, it's a commandlet that 
oddly enough, it invokes SQL command. Go figure. Uh, it is part of the uh, SQL PS module. So to use it, you have to import module SQL PS. Disable name checking for your own sanity, right? If you've never saved data to SQL before, um, this disable name checking, it, it avoids this warning that you get. It's all about reserved words, right? So I'm going to be taking my glasses on and off so I can see the screen and see you. Um, <coughs> we, all have, we all know what reserved words are. So when the, uh, when the SQL team created the, the new commandlets for backup and restore, oddly enough, uh, backup is a reserved word in PowerShell and restore maybe, I'm not sure. And so the PowerShell team said, well, you can't call this backup SQL database because you know backup is a reserved word. And they said, we're backing up a SQL database and these are DBAs. If we call it anything else, they're gonna lynch us. So it has to be backup SQL database, right? Um, or maybe it's just backup database. I don't know, I don't use those commandlets. I think backup and restore belongs in T-SQL. Um, so if you if you don't disable name checking, you're going to get this little warning that says that you know the world's going to blow up because they're using a reserved word. So all it does is turn off that warning. All right. So I'm going to set my query object, and then I'm just going to set a variable, and that's going to come in very handy later. I'm going to set a variable equal to the results of this query, and you see you pass in the server instance and the database. Those can also be variables. And then I'm just going to output this to a table. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. There we go. It's a very small table. I got three entries, and I just output this. And now uh, I've got my, my column headers up here. And this is very poorly formatted right here because I've got, uh, I've got resolution issues. But you see that I get everything right here. Now, if I dot source this, same call if I can get this there we go if I dot source this dot sourcing allows me to have to change the scope of the variable so now I have this variable cache a I have this variable available to me right here so now if I say cache a you can see that I get it again right but if I do a get member on that and this is the crux of what I want to teach you right now when I do a get member on that you notice how it comes through as a data row and all of the columns are now properties. That's how I'm able to get a format table on it. So every single one of the table columns that I've pulled back, because notice how this is just select star from drive space, right? So every one of those table columns is now a property and I can access them as a format table. So if I were to say something like get a format table and say name and all I wanted was name and free space, then I can get just those two columns. And now I have discrete columns for every single one of my pieces of information. Everybody get that? Cool. That's going to be important later on. Now, let us contrast that with regular SQL command. So if I do that same thing, and this is the same script, only instead of calling invoke SQL command, I'm just calling SQL command and I'm passing the variables now, right? I've got server, database, name, query, the exact same thing. This is the same thing that you would run in DOS, right? If you ran a SQL command and I'm setting it equal to a variable. So now if I run this, there we go. And notice I'm going to dot source that again, right? Uh, there we go. So now, if I look at CMD, notice it's not formatted at all, right? I get this ugly, what I like to call the puke of text, right? Just <coughs> out on the screen. But look what happens when I do a get member against it. I don't have any of those discrete columns anymore. The only property I have is length. And that's because this came through as a string. Really, really crappy, right? That's why we needed a commandlet for it. So the, the moral of the story here, okay, the moral of the story here is that if you want 
to read data from SQL, you cannot use SQL command. You have to use invoke SQL command if you're going to use so if you're going to use one of these guys, right? If you're going to write data, sure you can use it, right? You can just build your query and call the query. That query can be an insert, it can be an update, it can be an SP call with parameters passed, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a valid query, it can be anything at all, right? But you cannot read data and get it and get it in discrete columns. If you try, uh, you're going to get this puke of text, which means if you want to use this, then you're going to have to regex all of that data out of there. Uh-uh, not going to happen. Way too problematic. I saw somebody try once. He gave up after like two weeks because he only had two columns parsed. So not going to happen. So there you go. Now, let's take a look at a couple better ways. Okay, good. Um, I'm already watching my time. <laughs> Let's see where I want to go with this next. Okay, so now let's look at some .NET methods. Now I'm going to show you two .NET methods here for looking at data, and there's and, and I'm not going to pound these into the ground right now because I'm going to pound them into the ground in a couple subsequent scripts, right? So, are any of you guys collecting data right now, like this? Are, are any of you guys taking data from your servers and putting it into into SQL? No, one. Okay, good. Now the question comes, what kind of data are you going to be collecting, right? I'm, I'm choosing to look at SQL metadata right now, but you could also pull, you could also run uh, ETL processes off of this. Um, the question comes, why would you want to run ETL off of this versus SIS, right? I think we discussed that a little bit later, but right now, um, you guys are using what for your uh, for your server list. How, how are you guys keeping track of all of your servers? No, you don't have to raise your hand. Just, I'm sorry? Active Directory. Wow, okay. And how are you, how are you signifying that it's a SQL box in Active Directory? Okay. And, but, and, and so how do you access that? So let's say that you want to run something against all of your servers. How do you access that information? Do you go out and, and have AD query all, uh, you know, like 2,000 boxes every single time you want to run a query against them to find out which ones have services running? And where do you store that data? Right. Okay. So you're not getting it from AD. You're getting it from a SQL database that was populated from AD, right? Right. Okay, good, because I was about to go, what the hell? <laughs> you understand what just happened here, right? <laughs> the misunderstanding that just happened here? He's, his company is pulling a list of SQL boxes from AD by querying the services, which is great. That's, that's how you do it. Um, I wish AD would actually store that information so we could just get it, but they don't. So once a week they go out and they store that, they, they query all of, all of their servers and see which ones have SQL on them, and store that, and I assume that it updates or deletes or whatnot your, your SQL table. And uh, initially, it sounded like he was telling me that every single time he runs a script, they go out and query AD for all of their boxes and then pull that list back. And I'm like, oh my god. So, okay, so you're storing in a SQL database. Good, because that's what you should be doing. It. Is anybody doing anything different? CMS? If you're doing CMS, don't admit to it. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, and nobody else is doing anything? Okay, perfect. Um, how many servers do you guys have, give or take? Give or take. A thousand? Good, perfect. Hundred? Good. You should have a, a vague idea of how many servers you have, right? Okay, so a thousand and a hundred. We'll work with that. Um, all right, so are you doing anything are you doing anything like this to, to manage your Okay. Okay. And where is your database of record? Okay, good. So you're keeping a list of all of your servers in SQL. Good. You're going to get a lot out of this session. Okay, so <coughs> um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at the two methods. First, we're going to use a data reader. Now, a data reader is without a doubt 
the fastest way to query data. Period, end of discussion, there isn't a faster method. Um, and part of the reason why is because it takes all the overhead out by being complete BS to work with. Um, it, makes you, it, it makes you drag everything out of it tooth and nail, right? So ta let's take a look at that. And you're going to see me do this a little bit later because all I'm trying to do is get data as fast as I can. So here's a function, query DB1. Uh, that was the predecessor to DB2 for the, any of you who don't know. Um, so I'm going to set up my connection, um, and I'm and I'm hard coding uh, this in here, pulling it in from the uh, from the parameters that come in. I'm going to set my command as a SQL command, and I'm going to pass it the query and the connection. You'll see down below is where the query and the connection get passed in. I'm going to open it. I'm going to set a reader variable equal to the execution of the command object. Now the results come in. And I realize, guys, I, I, I do my best here, but it's really hard to sit here for an hour and a half and just look at somebody explain lines of code. Um, so if I just, if I, if I get like Tourette's and just start screaming swears every now and then, it's just to keep you guys awake. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I start up a results uh, array. And while I'm reading the reader, I have to create a new row for every single one of these. This is, this is my attempt to take some of the BS out of the reader and make this readable. The function itself makes it readable. So for every row now, I'm going to set an iterator object. And if it's less than field count, and while it's less than field count, I'm going to get the name of that first field, and then I'm going to get the value of that first field. And then in the second field, and the third field, and the fourth field, and the fifth field, right? So I've got to get the name and I've got to get the value. If you don't do that, then you've got to access it by the zero-based array iterator, right? So it's actually, and then I just set these results equal to the new PS object, and I'm going to pass it that row property. So what I get from this is, let me go back to DB1. There we go. So I'm just going to select the top 100 from my databases table here and I'm going to pass it the server, the database name, and the query, and the server and database name are set up here at the top, just to make things easier. So when I do this, where am I? I'm on .NET. There we go. So now, when I do this, you know I don't get anything because all I did was set query results equal to that. I haven't returned it yet, right? I've just set that variable equal to it. So now if I want to get that in my current iteration, I have to dot source it. And now I get my data back. It's not very pretty, right? It's formatted as a list. So now if I want to format it as a table, now I can get it better. It's at least more readable now, right? So. I can also do a get member on that. Oops. Now if I get member on that, you notice how it's coming back as my custom PS object because I had to create that object at the end, right? Right here. Where am I? Right here I created that new object and passed it in the property of the row that I just built. And that row that I just built for every single field, I got the field name and the field value for every single row. And I put that in a collection and then pass that in as properties, right? OK. But you notice how even with this, every single one of these note properties is a column from a database. So I have achieved my goal and that now I have discrete pieces of information that I've passed in, right? Now, let's look at a different way. Now we're going to use, instead of the data reader, now we are going to use a data set. A data set has a little bit more overhead than a data reader, and by a little bit, I mean it depends on how much data you're pulling back. If you're pulling back 100 rows, it is a little bit of overhead, big deal. If you're pulling back a few thousand rows, it's a little bit more overhead, and it's still not really that big of a deal, because who cares if it takes an extra second to pull back a couple thousand rows, right? If you're pulling back a couple thousand rows, 
from 40,000 databases on 1,000 servers, it's got a lot of extra overhead because that time adds up fast, right? Take that extra second per database, multiply it by the 40,000 databases, right? And then divide that by 60, and that tells you how much more, how many more, how much time it's going to take, right? So that time really adds up. And if you're doing these collections every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, every hour, then it really starts to add up, right? If it takes, if you're running that every 15 minutes and it takes 10 and a half minutes to run, that's a big deal versus whether it takes two minutes to run. So, okay. So let's take a look at, no. Again, we're inside our function. I'm setting the connection string, no big deal there. <coughs> same connection object, I'm passing it the connection string. Now my command is the same thing. It's a SQL command and I open it. Here's where, the, here's where it gets really cool. I, I set the adapter object equal to a new SQL adapter. Now the adapter is sort of a bridge between my, uh, between my command object, between my command reader and my data set. And it's what actually does that little translation up here that I did manually in here. So it kind of does that for you, right? So I'm gonna get my adapter, I've got my data set. Now I've got to fill my adapter with my data set object. And then to get my data back, I've got to call dataset.tables. Now we're gonna, we're gonna look at that a little bit later, but this is actually um, a very rich object. And one of, the, one of the, the differences between these guys is with your data reader, it is like your forward only fire hose cursor that you have in SQL. It goes through the data once and stops and that's it. Vroom, bam, that's it. It spits out the data and no more, right? You have to call it again. You have to query it again if you want to get the if you want to use the data in multiple places. With the data set object, it holds the data. It's a it's what we call a disconnected object, right? So it queries and then it keeps that data and you can use it again and again and again and again and again. And you can query multiple tables. You can actually query multiple tables with the, the data reader as well, but I never do that because it's such BS. I always use this one. But you can call multiple tables. That's why if I had multiple tables in here, and I think we have a multiple table query later, yeah, we do, then you're going to get to see how that works. And you can take a bunch of little tiny queries that you want to run and slap them all together so you're not having to constantly open and close that connection, right? So, okay. And this is going to look the exact same. Let's go ahead and call DB2. There we go. I actually didn't think uh, I didn't think through those names very well. I hate giving a SQL session and calling it DB2. And I should call it Oracle 1 and Oracle 2. There we go. And I'll dot source that again. Same thing. I don't get it until I call my variable, right? Because you get that, right? Because I'm just setting the variable here. I haven't actually called it yet. You get that? OK, perfect. Because I know some of you said you didn't know PowerShell. And the same thing, if I do a GM on that one, you notice this time I get back my data row instead of my custom object. But when the rubber hits the road, I still have my columns. And that's what really counts. It doesn't really matter how I got them as long as I got them. Now, to data reader or to data set? Frankly, it really doesn't matter. I mean, unless you're doing really super high-end stuff, and it sounds like you might be, you're doing really high-end stuff, pulling back hundreds of thousands or millions of rows, it's really not going to matter that much which one of these guys you use. Um, I say go with the data set because it's just easier to work with, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you're pulling back that many rows, that uh, that extra time for the data set is going to matter to you. As a matter of fact, um, when we, when we uh, get in here and I start showing you how to work with the data reader like explicitly, um, even doing this little translation to get these, to get these values right here is really going to matter as well. And you'll see that I explicitly don't do that. Uh, it makes the code harder to read, but in a lot of ways, it's going to, in, in, a, in a way, it's going to be a lot faster. Okay, so now I think we are jumping into uh, rebar operations. So I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. You get that later. 
Yes, okay, so now we are talking about a basic .NET call with a reader. Now, <clears throat> this is the fastest call that we could possibly make. Um, and there are really two sides to this equation. I like to call it, I personally like to call it a reader and a feeder, just because it's, it, it's a nice rhyming, right? Um, so the reader is, and, and really there are two, there, there are two separate things you have to concentrate on here, right? When, <clears throat> when you're setting up these scripts, get one down before you get the other. The reader has all of its own properties, because they're two separate operations, right? When I read data from a database, or from a file, or from a web page, or wherever I'm getting my data, <coughs> there are different, there are almost always different methods to do that with, with everything you got, right? So <coughs> when I read my data, always set up your reader first and get it going as fast as you can. Any troubleshooting you need to do with your data collections, and I'll just genericize it as data collections because regardless of where you get it from, right? So the, the point here is that when you have this type of data collection, pull it in from your reader, and if your reader is slow, then you need to get that fixed first. If you're doing a data set object and it's too slow, then try a reader object. And if it speeds it up significantly, then fine. If you're pulling too much data, or if you're pulling it from the wrong sources, or if you're not indexed on the other side, whatever, <clears throat> or if your network is too slow, if, you're, if you don't have enough RAM in your, in your server to hold the data set, and you're, and you're starting to spill the disk, something like that. But if you can't get the data back very fast, then there's no point in moving forward. But if you write the reader and what I call the feeder, which is whatever, whatever that is going to feed, right? In this case, we're going to feed the console and we're going to look at it uh, manually, but you could be feeding a database, you could be feeding a text file, you could be feeding another process, right? So whatever this reader is feeding, whatever is consuming it, which is why I call it a feeder because, you know, it feeds the consumer. Um, if you do them both at the same time and you've got it and you've got a slow process, then now you've doubled your troubleshooting effort, right? But if you know for a fact that when you pull your data in from the database and it comes in in two seconds and then you go to the feeder and it increases by 10 seconds, well, you know the problem's not the reader, right? You've already optimized that. So optimize these things separately. And now I'll, I'll, I'll say always optimize the reader first. Why do I want you to optimize the reader first? I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. It's a, that was a gimme question. I was hoping somebody would get it, right? Yeah, because you know you can't optimize the feeder if you haven't read the data yet, right? So, um, okay. So with this, this is the exact same thing as before. I've just pulled it out of a function and put it into a script. So we've got the exact same thing here. We've got our object all the way open. We've got our command. I'm selecting the top 10,000 this time, uh, opening my connection. Now, my data, I'm setting uh, uh, DR, set, uh, stands for data reader, equal to the uh, execute reader. If it has rows, I'm going to get a field count, which we'll never see because it's going to zip by so fast. Um, and while, it's, while I'm able to read it, I'm just going to write host. Now again, I said this is as fast as I can get. Notice how I'm not bothering translating the columns for you, right? So we're, we're not really going to have any idea what that is. It's just going to spit the data out to the, to the screen as fast as possible. And let's see, what was that SQL script to? And we didn't have anything at all. We're just spitting the data out as fast as we can. So this is clearly not meant for human consumption, right? Do you do stuff like this when you, when you do it? Do you, do you keep from translating? Do you use a reader and keep from translating? How do you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And, it, and you're pulling millions of rows too, and it matters, doesn't it? So while that runs, I said I was pulling 10,000. See, I wanted you to kind of feel the pain, right, of, of 10,000 rows being sipped through. There we go, that's not too bad though. So okay, does everybody get this? Is there anything? 
is there anything I need to go over on how this works? Because uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? You're getting the data and you're basically just cursoring through and writing it as you go along and not translating any of these values whatsoever. Okay, we'll call two, we'll call three. Okay, now we're gonna do the same thing with a data set, only now we're going to, uh, we're gonna automatically have our table value, our, our table columns given to us. But this is interesting, everything here stays the same until we get to the data fill. And here we're choosing to name the table as it comes in. Let me see, let me go back to this other, this other one, it was the .NET one, there we go. So you see here when we filled the data set, we just filled the data set. But here we're gonna fill the data set and this is an overload, right? The first one has, has only one parameter that you pass in and that's the, that's the data set object. This overload has two parameters, and it's the data set object and the name of the table. So I remember before where I pulled in, here we are, data set dot tables, right? So I'm pulling in, since I've only got one table there, it's just going to give me the data back from that table because I've said, you know, call the tables collection. But here I'm naming that table, and I'm naming it databases. So now I'm saying for each row, in ds.tables, in this table, databases, give me the rows, and then just write it out. And now I'm able to call it explicitly on the column names. And, where am I, SQL call three? Looks about the same. If you'd have seen it at the top, you'd seen that we had the, the column names. But the data itself is going to look the same. So, and uh, let's see. I thought there was one where I was doing a comparison here, but I am not. Okay. Okay, perfect. Good. All right, now let's move on. Are there any questions on data set versus data row? We're gonna use them a lot, so don't worry. We're gonna build on this stuff. Right now we're just setting up the basics still. It's equal four. Okay, now we're gonna get into a reader with a feeder now. So we're gonna start with rebar operations because rebar operations and bulk load operations have different characteristics and you're gonna use them at different times. Basically, what I like to say is you're, you're trading in one set of complications for another, right? Um, <coughs> when you have, everybody likes to say that rebar is bad. Oh, we have to bulk load data into SQL, but sometimes that's not necessary. I mean, sometimes it's not available to you, right? Sometimes you're trying to uh, merge this data with other data. Sometimes you need to more like transform it, right? Which you really can't do when you're doing bulk load operations because it just goes here, and there, it's like taking a big bucket, scooping it up, and then just throwing it into the database, right? Whereas now you're taking little teaspoons and putting in there one at a time. Now this can still be really fast, but when you start getting into the thousands of rows, the hundreds of thousands of rows, the millions of rows, you're really gonna feel it. <coughs> so what we're doing so far, we're still using the data reader, so the reading is gonna be as fast as we can possibly make it, so nothing there is gonna change. You guys don't mind, I dropped it down to 1,000 to instead of 10,000, right? Um, so now nothing has changed except while we read, and this is the same script as before, instead of outputting it to the screen, we're going to build a query. And I've got, a, um, I've got a, a, an SP on the back end, and again, I'm doing it as fast as I can. See, here's where it makes it a little bit harder, because these are the parameters I'm passing in value one, value two, value three, value four. So I have no idea what these values are. I have to take these guys and match them. Okay, so there's value zero, there's one, there's two, there's three, and I have to make sure that I've got the right values down here as well. So it's not really user friendly at all from the aspect of, okay, now I need to maintain this code. But sometimes you're gonna have to give up that maintainability 
for the super, super speed that you're going to get uh, by not doing that translation. Now, here's something. And, uh, actually, I think I need to set my database back up. Yeah. Here, let me just go to the top. I think I need to be here. There we go. That should do it. Now, one rule I'm going to give you, always, 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 let me comment that out. <coughs> Take this advice, because I do this all the time. Whenever you have a collection, first off, the first thing you do is you, uh, is you save this data to a text file or to the screen so that you can see it. I've got the SQL call. I'm saving my SQL call to a variable. Always set your SQL call to a variable, right? Because uh, I think you're going to get to see this later on. But if you have different versions of SQL especially, this is really going to come in handy. Um, because for one version of SQL, you're going you're gonna to use this SP call. For another version of SQL, you may use this SP call, right? You're going to format it differently for different versions of SQL or for different situations. And that makes it a lot easier if I'm just setting it to a variable and then I have my call and then I have my call. And down here, ultimately, when I do that, when I, when I do my save, whatever is in this variable gets saved. So it makes it a lot easier when I set everything up here and then just use that once. And I could use that 100 different times. It doesn't matter as long as I'm setting that object every single time. So let me get rid of this if, it's, if it exists now. There it is. There we go. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this, and it's going to save that data. It's going to print this call to the screen, and then it's going to save it to a file. And the reason why I want to save this to a file, is that SQL 4? That's SQL 4. Is you want to always get your data worked out first, because it's going to be a lot easier to troubleshoot this on the SQL side. We're all SQL people here, right? None of us are actually .NET people. Good. So we do it just enough of this stuff to get back into SQL where we're comfortable, right? So I want to know if there are going to be any problems. And here is the file that I created with all of my SP calls in it. So I'm just going to grab that. There we go. And see if everything is OK by running it. So if I've got a 1,000 servers and tens of thousands of databases that I'm going to run this against, I want to know if there's going to be any version of SQL that's going to give me something funky. right? And I want to get that taken care of right away, which I can very easily do with a rebar operation. So this succeeded. I've, I should have a 1,000 rows in the database right now. There we go. Got a thousand rows in the database. So my my mouse froze up. Hold on. It does this sometimes when I record. Gives me about five seconds of frozen. There we go. Okay. So now I've got that worked out. Now I can do my actual save. Oops. Commented out the wrong one. There we go. No. I said go up then back. There we go. So I still want to print this to the screen because I don't want to just have a, a, a cursor just blinking at me the whole time this is going. And I'm using my invoke SQL command to save. Okay, so the invoke SQL command discussion. This is a fine method, especially at the beginning if you've never done this before, because it's a really easy call to make. Uh, invoke SQL command, you pass it in the, the query parameter and you're golden, right? The problem is, is you're going to sacrifice a little bit of performance. And that little bit of performance is going to be a lot of performance if you have a thousand objects or if, or if you have, if you're going through a thousand uh, servers with a thousand objects per query, right? So the more you get, uh, the, the bigger problems you're going to have. And the reason why is because this invoke SQL command has to open and close and instantiate for every single row. So for row number one, I pull this into memory. I connect to the database. And you know what the database handshake is like. It's like seven different calls, right? 
and then I and then I push the, the thing there and then I close it, disconnect and close, same thing again and again and again. Yeah. Ask that again. Not to my knowledge, no. No, it, it opens and closes every single time. Um, and that really bears out, too, when you look at the, uh, um, uh, when you look at the performance on the back end. It really, I mean, it, it's fast. Um, I do this all the time, and I see it not reusing it constantly. So, <laughs> you know, um, but even, but, but I will say, even on ones when it's reusing it, it still will open and close that connection. It still has to make that handshake every single time, and it still has to instantiate the, the uh, commandlet every single time. It's, it's, it's like an inline query function, right? For every single row, it's going to call that function right it's just absolutely horrendous and like I said the performance here is actually pretty good but only in comparison with nothing else so when I do this I mean that's writing data to the database that's pretty damn fast right we just did a thousand rows I hope we just did a thousand rows let's see we've got a thousand in there now and we got two thousand good so it did actually write the data and this is a small data set this is as this is actually as good as it's going to get, right? So if you're going through a lot of databases and a lot of servers and you're pulling back however much, you know, we're pulling back a list of databases here, it won't be too bad, especially if you're only doing it once or twice a day. It's not that big of a deal, right? But if you, the more databases you have, the more servers you have, the more often you're going to collect this data, you're really going to start to feel it. Let me see what else I wanted to say about this script. Okay, good. Now, you notice <coughs> as well that in this collection, we are still just pulling in the, we, we still got everything hard coded, right? I'm still just going to localhost and just going to a single database. We haven't done anything dynamic yet. We're going to. And that's when things really start to get interesting. Okay, so SQL call four, let's go to five. I didn't name these things very well, so every time I open up one of these scripts, it's just as big a surprise to me what we're going to talk about as it is to you. Okay, so, oh, we're already here. Okay. <coughs> so we've added a lot of stuff to the script. We've gone from script one to like script 17 in one fail swoop, right? So first and foremost, we've moved all of our connection info to an include. And let's go ahead and open up that include and show you what it's got in it. So. Here is our, our repo server and database, and then we've got this little function to log errors with. Now, you always, always, always want to do this kind of stuff in an include file. I know you know why. Anybody else know why? Yeah, not only so you can easily reuse it, <coughs> but because right now you guys are all at the first job you've ever had, right? You've never had another job and you don't plan on going to another job? Okay, so you plan on going to another job and when you do, you're gonna throw away everything that you've done at this job and you're gonna start from scratch at your next job because you like writing scripts so much you wanna reinvent the wheel every single time. Right, I know I do. So, <clears throat> now, I've learned this, I, I learned this lesson the hard way. When I started, when, when I started with PowerShell, um, I wasn't a very good VB scripter because everything in PowerShell is this long and everything in VB script is that long. So I wasn't a very good VB scripter. So <coughs> I didn't have a lot of experience with scripting when PowerShell came out. So I had all of my stuff hard coded like I did before and then I switched jobs and then I had like 45 scripts to go through and change all of those objects for. And you know what? I did it. And then I went to the next job and I did it again. And I was like, there's got to be a better way than this, right? It took, no, 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 no. It took me three jobs to start doing this. So when I say you're going to get 20 or 40 or 60 or something of these scripts down, you're going to get a lot of scripts down and you want to go to one place to change this information and then you're up and running in your new environment, okay? 
So you're not building scripts for your job. You're not building scripts for these specific tasks. You're building scripts for you to use every single place you go, right? And even scripts that are highly specialized for, for your environment, if you've got an ETL load, you've still got a framework that you can use. You've still got methods that you use, and you're just gonna replace the middle with everything else, right? Okay, so that's number one. We're adding in uh, that include. Now we're also pulling back, and this is for you guys that have it, we're also pulling back our list of servers that we're gonna run this against from the database. Now it just so happens in this case that the repo server and the client server are the exact same, right? Because I'm on a single laptop here, <coughs> but they won't be. So I'm pulling back the, the ID and the server name and the SQL version. I always like to pull back the SQL version when I do this stuff because so much stuff relies on the version. And, and, and your thousand SQL boxes, they're all the exact same version, I'm sure, and you never have version issues at all, right? Absolutely, good, I'm glad to hear it. And I bet they're all 2016 too, aren't they? Yep, perfect. <laughs> that, was part of the, that was part of the 2016 plan, right? It goes into WSS and it just upgrades your entire environment. <coughs> Actually, did you hear about that? That's what they're doing now. When you, they're, they're doing something very similar. When you upgrade an instance on a box, SQL 20 to 2016, it automatically upgrades all the instances on that box. So beware, you can't upgrade just a single instance on a server. It will upgrade every single one of them out from under you. So just, I wanted to, the little PSA, right? Okay, do y'all have those here, PSAs? Public service announcements? Okay, we, we have them in the States when, a, when a, a celebrity does something bad. They make them go on and do a PSA and say, I was an alcoholic, don't let this happen to you. Drugs are bad, okay? All right, so everything here change is, is the same except we're pulling back our list of instances and everything we need. Sometimes, in some of my queries, I'm actually pulling back whether or not it's a cluster because I need to know that information. Sometimes I'm pulling back whether or not it's an AG. So you're gonna have to model yourself a little database, right, to find out um, <coughs> to, to, to your needs. And feel free, by all means, to take this query right here and turn it into an SP call. In fact, I advise it because the more complicated it's gonna be, right, oh, well, I need this and I need that and I need that information, I need that, to figure out all the information you're gonna get will require an SP and then you just return these things at the end. So now for each one of these server names, I'm setting the current server equal to something. I'm setting an ID. For those of you that don't know PowerShell, that's the current iteration. Now I'm just printing the current server to the screen. Execution date time. This is a really important thing to do. Is this the one where I need to do this thing? Yep. Um, if you're pulling collections for something, now like I said, I'm, I'm I'm concentrating on metadata collections here. You probably aren't as interested in this for ETL purposes, uh, but for the types of collections I'm doing where I'm pulling like uh, uh, drive information or um, database information, database properties or table properties or index properties, something like that, it's really important to me to know when that collection happened because now I can run queries and alerts and whatnot and oh this database has disappeared or this database is new from the last collection or this index has changed from the last collection something like that right so that's the whole point of pulling in this type of data um, if you've got a, a huge list of servers you you should be having your code manage these servers for you right you shouldn't have to have somebody say oh look this extra database showed up right you should have your system tell that tell you that itself right oh, this index changed, oh, this table changed. You should be pulling in all of this information yourself and running alerts based off of queries that, that we're doing here. That's what we're doing here, right? That's why this is so important, is it helps you manage your environment. And you can't tell me if a database was added or if a database was taken away or if a login was added to some group or if a login was given permissions to a new database if you don't know when the data was collected. Now. Where you put this is also important because when, when Jen and I teach uh, our, our enterprise scripting pre-con, we have a nice section on this that I'm gonna just kind of fold up for you here real quick. For most of this stuff, doing it at the server level is gonna be good enough. 
the execution date time. I need to know when it hits each one of these servers. If I'm iterating through a thousand servers, then I really only need to know when it hits each individual server. <coughs> if I'm pulling drive space information, I don't have to put the execution date time down here for every single row because I don't need to know that the C drive was collected at this millisecond and the D drive was connected at, was collected at this millisecond and this one was collected at this millisecond. Oh, good God. Who manages drives by the millisecond, right? I need to know that in general, it was 832. That's all you really need to know, right? There are times when you may need to know it down at the millisecond. Not with anything I do, but maybe with stuff you do, right? Maybe if you're pulling stuff like, uh, like uh, IIS log data and you may need to know something like that, right? Or you may need to do it at the database level. So if I'm doing something for specific databases, I can't see if I am here. Yeah, so here I'm doing it with specific databases. So for every database, I'm pulling in the DB name, the recovery model, the read only, and the mirroring partner. So if I've got 32,000 databases on my server, <coughs> then I might want to know when each individual database was collected. But for the most part, this is going to move so fast, it's still going to be just milliseconds. It's not that big of a deal, right? Right, right. And it could be, right? So sometimes we suggest doing it at three different places. If you're so inclined, if you're like a real control freak and you just want to know every little thing, right? So you could put one up here at the top to be the, to be the, the batch collection time. And then you could put one down here for the server collection time. And then you can put one down here for the database collection time. If you want that level, if you want that level of three different collection times, um, then you can tell every little tiny step of the way when something went wrong, like he said, knock yourself out. I personally think that's a little overkill. I do it at the server level most of the time, and there's no reason to go beyond that. Oh, sorry, my, my little thing right here. There we go. I must have had it in the wrong spot because now it's back to tickling my cheek. Um, I feel like I've got a hamster asleep on my face. Okay, so now for each one of these, I'm checking to make sure that there are no errors because if there's an error collect connecting to the server, there's no need to go any further, right? And if there is, then I'm going to call my log errors uh, function and I'm going to move on to the next one. Otherwise, I'm going to pull a list of databases and I'm going to use the dash force, which forces me to see the system databases. I get that question a lot. Um, if you don't use dash force, then it only gets user databases. Now, for each one of those databases, I'm going to set the database name, the recovery model read only, and the mirroring partner. And here's my query object again. I'm going to set my SP call. And I'm going to print this to the screen this time. I'm just going to print it to the screen because I think I'm only taking a few of these values. How many of these values am I doing? Um, oh, I'm just doing the ones that are there. Okay. So you notice how we're using the SQL provider for this? We're going to use a query soon, I think. So now let me go run that SQL script that updates this object. And I want to show you this is one of the first special things we're going to run into right there. There we go. SQL 5. Right, so you see, this is a problem. We've got an SP call here that ends in a comma. That's not going to run, right? And the reason that's not going to run is because we have our mirroring partner here. Most of these databases aren't mirrored. So the mirroring partner coming back from sys databases or coming back from this DB list is going to be null. So now we've got this set to null. There you go. There's your null. So we have to figure out how to how to set it to the value if it's if it's got one and set it to the word null if it doesn't have one. Does everybody understand the problem? Cool. Sometimes I have a hard time getting getting people to understand why this is an issue. All right, so let's go on to number 6. Not there, there. There we go. Okay. 
So now we're going to solve our issue with nulls. Let me see what else. Oh, okay, good. So we're going to go to here. I'm, I'm setting, this is something I got used to doing in the old days back in uh, 05 and whatnot. <clears throat> and I still do hit some 05 databases that when you've got something coming in as a bit, <coughs> PowerShell will change it from a one and zero and it'll see that it's a bit and it'll change it to true and false. And then when you try to save that to SQL, it says eh, it has to be one or zero, right? So if you instantiate that as an integer, it'll keep it as a one or a zero. I'm not sure if it keeps it as a one or a zero or if it changes it from true back to a one or a zero. But all the same, I get a one or a zero and then I can save it to SQL. These days, it's not really that important. Um, it, it SQL's smart enough to, to read that and it pushes it back to a one or a zero and it saves it just fine. But just because I hit those older databases sometimes, I still do an integer and it makes me personally feel better. Um, so now here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say if this mirroring partner coming in, and notice how I'm checking the row iterator value, right? If it equals db null, let me show you what that looks like. A null is a null is a null is a null, right? Nah. There are db nulls and there are PowerShell nulls, right? Um, and there are probably .NET nulls too. So I'm going to set the variable db null equal to the system data type db null and I'm going to take its value, which its value, oddly enough, is going to be a database null. I know it's kind of convoluted. It should just be a null as a null as a null, but it's not. So now that I've got this, now I can just say, if this value equals null, and depending on what I'm pulling in, you're going to see why I do this in a minute, depending on where I'm pulling from, or if it's a PowerShell null, I do that specifically for a reason. Like I said, I'll show you that in a little while then set it equal to null. Otherwise, set it equal to the value itself. Now, <coughs> this is a little trick that throws a lot of people. When I'm comparing it up here, I'm comparing it to the current iterator property. When I'm writing it down here, you notice how I took that property and surrounded it with parentheses with another dollar sign on the outside of it. <sighs> right? Okay, so how do I explain this? Because it's in double quotes, it's going to automatically expand the value, right? That's the difference between single quotes and double quotes. A single quote gives me, uh, it gives me the literal value. Double quote expands the value and gives me the, and gives me the value inside the parameter itself, right? So if I were just calling a parameter, like if I were calling this guy right here inside of here, I wouldn't need to do this. But since I'm calling a property, I need to get that property. And, if, and also, if I were just calling this, I wouldn't need to do it. So in order to call a property, I need to surround it in parentheses, which tells it to execute this guy and give me the property, and then set it equal to a little temporary type variable thing in here. So it's sort of, a, sort of a temporary variable that I'm doing because this parentheses right here tells it to execute what's inside. That's an execute operator. And then I'm surrounding it with single quotes. I know this is a thick little, little tiny nuanced piece of, of code, but you need to understand this because you're going to do it a lot when you're saving data to SQL this way. So it's a precedence, right? The double quotes tells it to expand the value of the operator. But it's the outermost, it's the outermost quotes that take effect. Because you notice I've got single quotes and double quotes in here. So which one takes effect, right? It's the outer quotes that tells it to it that tells it to expand the values, which now makes these inner quotes just nothing but inner quotes. So what I'm going to get here is I'm going to get the mirroring partner that I've expanded inside single quotes itself. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Because I know that's, that's difficult to get at first. Um, 
And up here, I'm not putting null in single quotes at all, right? I'm just, I'm just taking the exact value of null. And here, it could be single quotes or double quotes. It doesn't really matter. But for continuity, I use single quotes. So now, that's going to give me, and I'm saving it directly to the database this time, it looks like. And that's SQL 6. And now I'm actually saving the data to the database every single time. And notice how I've got my nulls here. I don't have any mirrored databases on my laptop, so I can't really, I can't really show you what that looks like. But it would have the value in there in single quotes. <clears throat> but I don't really like this because the solution I've got here, look at, my, look at my line. I've got this one in single quotes right there. So I don't have to have it in single quotes down here. But I've got recovery model in single quotes, and I've got database name in single quotes, and I've got the, um, the execution date time in single quotes, because that's what I need. So some of, them are in, some of them are quoted down there, and some of them aren't. I don't like that. I like everything to be continuous. Is that a word? Uh, we'll say continuous. I like everything to have continuity. So in this next call, I think I can get rid of number five now. So on this next call, <coughs> I'm going to fix those, I'm going to clean this up a little bit, and I'm going to open up a really unintended consequence here. So you notice how I've done this with every single one of them. Yes, I will never get a database list from SQL that has database name null. Yes, I will always have a recovery model. Yes, I will always know whether it's read only. But that's just for this call. I may not be pulling from sys databases next time. I could be pulling from anything, right? Including customer data, right? So I may need to be able to do this for every single one. So for every single one of these guys, I'm now doing the exact same thing that I did with database partner. And now look, I'm doing it for read only. I'm doing it for recovery model. And if you look down here, I've taken all of my quotes out of here and now it's a much cleaner call because I'm handling quotes up at the top with the exception of this guy. Now this guy is interesting and this is an unintended consequence that I get from this. Let's run this. I want to show you what this looks like. Is that SQL 7? Watch this. Isn't that cute? I like that. It's just sort of this little data pyramid, right? <coughs> so for every single one of these rows, I'm pulling that row from the database, and I'm setting it either in quotes or not in quotes, right? Here's my database name, in single quotes. So every single time, I'm getting a fresh value because I'm pulling it from this current iteration variable, right? So every single row is new. But this execution date time was set up here. So it's not getting refreshed every single time for every single row. It's a static value. And what have I done? I've said, for the first row, I want you to set it equal to the execution date time in single quotes. Then the next time, I want you to set it to the execution date time in single quotes. But it's already got single quotes, so it gets another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And you can see that right here, how it just sits here and builds. This first one is the good one, and after that it gets two, then three, then four, then five, then six, right? So it just keeps building and building and building. And oddly enough, SQL won't import that. It's really weird that way. Um, so there are two ways we can handle this. First and foremost, we can just, before we read that every time, we can just replace single quotes with nothing so we can get rid of that last quote every single time. You kind of scowled. You kind of scowled. Do you get that? Okay, because you, you kind of went. Yeah, I don't like it either. Um, or next, um, you could make it the exception and always single quote it down here. Honestly, I go back and forth. Either one is just fine. I understand there, have to, there could be some exceptions down here. Um, every single thing that you do is going to add a little tiny bit of overhead to your, to your query, though, right? So now when we do this, though, now that I'm replacing this every time, I'm 
now it's straightened up and it's acting right, right? Now there's one more thing that you're going to have to be made aware of here, and I, 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 I can't make a demo for everything. <coughs> so sometimes, especially when you're doing stuff like this read-only value right here, when it's going to be a bit, you're not going to get it for this, but um, sometimes when you when you set this equal, because sometimes it's going to be null, right? Not read only, but sometimes you may have a, a a numeric value or a bit value that's that can be null sometimes. And when I set this thing to null here, that's a string. The next value comes in and it's populated and it's going to be a number. But guess what? This variable has already been instantiated as a string, so it's going to fail you're going to get a type conversion that says that it can't convert that, right? So what you need to do, and I didn't do it here, but I'm going to show you on the spot, is every single time you need to put this one as a string and then put that one as an int. So that every single time, regardless of the value, it's going to instantiate that, that variable the way it needs to be. Do you get that? Because it took me quite a bit really to go, why the hell is this randomly failing? It worked last time, why didn't it work this time? And it was because it was being instantiated as one and then being called as another. And it, you can't switch instantiations like that unless you specifically call it out. Okay, and I'm going till 1220. Crap, okay, gotta move. That was SQL what? Seven, good, SQL eight, okay. I'm going to blaze through this one because this isn't a regex session. But I want to show you the types of things that you can do. If you want to see how I do this, like if you don't know regex at all and you want to see it, I've got a session up on, uh, on regex on Midnight DBA. If you go to our events page, you can see my regex session where I show you how to do this. But I did want to show you real quick how cool this is, how, how easily you can do this because a script that takes you five days to expand, or every single time you go to expand uh, to a new collection, if it takes you three days or five days, is not a good script, right? That you don't have a good method down, you don't have a template, you don't have, you don't, you don't have a good process down if it takes you a week to write a new script, okay? So doing this rebar method that we're doing now <coughs> is relatively uh, hard to do. If you've got like a lot of columns doing this thing that I just did, let me pull back SQL 7, doing this thing that I just did here, if you're pulling back 70 columns, is going to be really laborious. So I'm going to show you how to do this with regex. So I've picked a column, I've picked a table here, uh, I'm pulling from DM exec request and I've already created the table. And the only reason I'm pulling it from DM exec request is because it's got like 30 or 40 columns and I wanted to show you what this looks like fully expanded, right? So if I come here to DM exec request, let me open up a new window there. I'm gonna grab these columns. I'm gonna pull them over here. Now I've gotta format this with regex, so I'm just going to say, look, I'm gonna look for a comma and a space and I'm gonna replace it with a new line and I've got my regex set. There we go. So now I've got these guys going all straight up and down. Now I'm going to grab this. I'm not going to do that just yet. I'll show you that. So now, nope. So now when I come here to number seven, I'm going to grab this guy right here. There we go. Just like that. And I'm going to take this name portion and I'm going to replace it with backslash one every single time I see it. One. And actually, I need that DB name too. Backslash one. Backslash one. And that'll do it. Okay, so now I'm going to replace all of that with this. So now I'm doing my curly brackets, which is my capture, and I'm going to do this only, not there, I'm going to do this only here. Look at my selection, use regex, 
and now I have just written all of those lines and now I can copy them and go into number eight and where is it here it is this is where they go and now I've written all of that stuff that I just had in there before so you can see how fast if you know something if you can do something like regex just a little bit of basic regex and that's really not as bad as it looks go watch my session it's really really easy um, I can build entire scripts like this and I can come in here on the back end and build the SP to populate that just as easily it takes about two minutes so now you've got all of this good coding practice in here that I just showed you and now you're doing it times 70 columns in like half a minute it's really really fast so um, it expands it's, it's a method that expands really well all right let's get rid of that one let's get rid of that one and this says okay <coughs> now this is the same method that we used last time nothing has changed except instead of the invoke SQL command we're actually using a .NET object so this time we are we're opening up the connection right here so we take care of all of this connection stuff and now we're still doing the same rebar method right here nothing has changed except here's our call and we open it and we save it to the database and not until the very end do we close the connection and that saves a lot of time so now we're not just open close open close open close open close we're gonna open write all of our data and then close and we're just sending each individual row to it as we see fit so nothing else has changed I'm gonna go ahead and close that okay getting into bulk inserts I'm gonna save that one for a second and jump up here because there are two different ways to do bulk inserts really the first one is BCP so <clears throat> here we're gonna do a simple BCP and I'm gonna kind of fly through B you know nobody really likes BCP anymore but I still think it's a dandy little tool it's absolutely fabulous now why would you use BCP over something else or, or over a bulk code or over a bulk copy well let's say that you're pulling in customer data you're getting text feeds from somebody that still happens all the time especially in healthcare right let's say that you want to collect a bunch of this data and then wait until you're less busy to push it into the database right let's say that you're gonna be creating data and pushing it out to clients via a text file or something right so there are a number of different reasons why you would want to do BCP and this is extremely easy um, pretty much everything stays the same except here I'm just gonna call my BCP out I'm passing in my my lovely complicated column delimiter here because I've seen too much too many pipes in the data itself especially in description fields so I got used to doing uh, tilde pipe tilde um, <clears throat> but for those of you that know how to pat how to build a BCP statement this is all just perfectly easy right so let's call BCP one in fact I think yep if I delete all this stuff oh good so I'll go up a row there we go and right there and you can see all my lovely BCP objects being created right there so it's very simple right <coughs> now with that in mind let's go ahead and look at BCP2 real quick so the same thing here and I'm gonna start flying through some of this stuff now having to deal with uh, having to deal with different instances the thing is is if I've got an instance right here if I've got if I've got an instance name anytime I call this where is it right here oh I don't need it here because I'm calling it from a list of databases okay good but if I'm using the object like I did before with a directory path 
because I'm using the because I'm using the .NET object and or the the PowerShell object instead, right? The provider. Then inside that path, everything has to have a uh, every SQL box you connect to. You have to connect to an instance. So if it's a default a default instance, you have to connect to slash default. You always have to have an instance name in SQL, right? You'll see that in the previous script how I'm, I'm using the directory path instead, right? Um, so you have to be able to parse that out because if I were to connect to BCP down here with the server name of localhost slash default, it would fail. But if I use the provider with localhost, then I have to have default. So I have to actually, actually have to have two different server names depending on what I'm going to do with it. If I'm going to connect to BC, if I'm going to use it as BCP or if I'm going to connect to the provider. So having to have both of these guys, you have to do a little parsing here that says if it doesn't equal this, then go ahead and set it to the default. And so that way, otherwise, if it is an instance, if it's a named instance, then I'm golden. I can just use the server name. But otherwise, I have to tack on default to it. So that's really the only difference here. Oh, other than the fact that here I'm using a DB list from a query instead of from the provider object. If you see in the last BCP, I was using the provider where I pulled uh, DB list equals dir, right? Where I pulled the directory. And here I'm just, uh, I'm using, I'm pulling a list of databases from a query and then just calling that instead. Let's go ahead and, wow, okay, let's go ahead and get into BCP3 real quick because it's got something in there I wanted to show you. I think that's this one. Nope, that's not this one. That's just a another subtle nuance that we don't care about right now. I thought it was. Anyway, uh, okay, let's get on to, anybody remember what number we stopped on? Nine. Maybe it was ten. It was ten. Give me the ten. Okay, good. So bulk insert. Nothing changes here. Nothing changes here for every single server. I've got my client query this time. Uh, same thing. Now, I'm setting my client string the same as I have before. My SQL command, same as I have before. My SQL reader, the same as I have before. Now, I'm setting my bulk copy equal to a, a SQL data client bulk copy, passing it in the repo string. This is funny right here. Um, when I pass in the bulk copy options, you can pass in different things. You can fire triggers, you can keep the identity column, right? Um, and then finally, I'm passing in the, desti the destination table name, which I've put up somewhere over here. There we go, the repo table. And finally, just calling write to server. It's really easy. You instantiate the object, pass it whatever values you want. You set the name of the destination table, and then you just say write to server, and it just plum, just drops all that stuff in the server for you very, very quickly. Now, the way I've done this here I've done this specifically for a reason. It will take the last value if you do it this way. It'll set this one, then it'll set this one, and override that one. So there's no way, the way I'm doing it here, to fire triggers and keep the identity value. You have to set one or the other if you do it this way. There's actually not a documented way that I have seen to set more than one of these bulk copy options at once. So if I want to fire triggers and do this or fire triggers and check constraints at the same time, there's no documented way I've seen anywhere in Microsoft or on the internet, but I'm going to show you how it's done. It's really, really easy, and it's not obvious as it turns out. I kind of lucked into it. Um, so when we do this, let's see, is this the one where we're going to play? Nope, this is not the one we're going to play. So I'm not going to run this one. I'm going to take a look at this one. OK, good. So this one brings up um, the table definition is different. <coughs> now, that's the thing with the bulk copy object. And this is what I was telling you about before. You're trading one set of complications for another when you're doing rebar versus bulk copy, right? So what do you do if you're bulk copying 
and the table definition of what you're bringing in is different from the table definition of what you want to save. Case in point, I'm pulling data in from sys databases, but it doesn't have the execution date time column in sys databases, right? It doesn't have the instance ID that I was also pulling in, right? It doesn't have those two control columns that I have in my central repo. It's got only those, so it doesn't know about those. So how do you pull in those two separate columns, right? That's what we're going to talk about here in the, in the next script. That was 11. So let's go into 12. So OK, <clears throat> we can do this with column mappings. So first and foremost, I can add these column mappings. Is this where we're also going to play with the thing? Uh, nope. Okay. So just by simply saying bulk copy dot column mappings dot add, I can map the source to the destination. So I'm just saying this column goes to this column. This column goes to that. Just like an SIS, right? When you're dragging those things across there, same thing. So if this were if this were you know recovery model two, then I would on the on the destination. That's what I would put it. So source destination. And again, if you've got 75 columns, this doesn't really scale well as far as being able to write it, right? But if you have that list of columns, you can do that regex trick that I showed you before and just pump it right in here and you're back down to 30 seconds, right? So you can do the column mapping. Oddly enough, that's not the one I use most of the time. I use this one. Okay, so here we are going to play with triggers. So I use this one. I insert the columns into the query. So if I want to keep my identity, which I don't, the default is not to keep the identity, then I need to query with a fake identity column so that it has an identity there that SQL can, can, can then throw away and ignore. It's grand, isn't it? So I'm going to throw this away and ignore it. I've got my uh, execution date time here. Now, this probably needs to be like that, doesn't it? Because I'm going to query. Now I'm setting my execution date time up here, where I was before. Where the hell did that go? Right here. And I'm hard coding it in the query, so it's going to return to. It's going to be returned as a hard coded value. Do you get that? Same thing here with the instance ID. So right here I'm setting my ID and here it actually needs to be ID like that. So now you just add those to the query and now when they're returned you have them there and now the the schemas do match the source and destination schemas do match. Do you see what I did there? Great. Now this is going to come in really really handy. This is an excellent method when you're having to query different versions of SQL because now you can say, I need this query to look like this for SQL 05, I need it to look like this for SQL 08, I need it to look like this for, you know, uh, for SQL 13, 2013. Um, and at the end, you're just going to do, you're just going to set it down here and you're going to go. Now this is where you're setting one, where you're trading one set of complications for another. I'm moving the problems that I have with dealing with nulls and dealing with data types and all that stuff that I had with the rebar operations. And now I'm moving those, those, uh, those problems into syncing up the schema on the, on the query side. So now you're taking all those problems that you're going to have down here and you're moving them into the query, whereas before I, was, I didn't have to worry about the schema matching because if it was null, it was just going to pipe in a null, right? Because we made sure of that. If it equals db null, then we're going to set it to a null, right? So we didn't care if sys databases in SQL 05 or SQL 2000 had the same values as it does in 2014 or 2016 because they were all checking for nulls and they were all going to work out all the time. Now they're not, right? Because if you're missing a column now, you're missing a column, right? Okay. And let's see where we are here with 14. Oh yeah, one thing that I forgot to talk about, that's what I wanted to talk about here, um, 13. For doing, uh, if we're doing these values here, if I'm firing triggers, 
this is my batch size. I've got my row count set at 100, so it's going to commit every single time I, every time I have that batch size. The trigger on the table is going to fire for every batch size. So if you've got that set to default, which is going to be the entire row set, that trigger is going to fire once for the entire load. Or it's going to fire here every 100 rows. So just know that. Down here, I'm looking for something specific. Here is how you set the multiple values. I create a value, I create a, a variable as a SQL copy options, as a SQL bulk copy options data type, and then I just list the ones in here that I want. So I want to fire triggers and check constraints. And then down here, I just call the ops. That's how you do multiples. And I'm going to put all these scripts up on the web for you guys, too, so you guys can just pull this stuff down. and You don't have to remember all this stuff. And where am I now? Number 15. Uh, oh, and here we are looking at pulling in multiple tables. So right here I've got select from DB properties and select from sys objects. And now I, pull, I fill my data set, and now I'm going to name each one of them. Uh, data set dot tables zero I'm going to name DB properties data set dot tables one I'm going to name sys objects and now I just save each one of them to the database I'm setting my table here my destination table is going to be databases identity and I'm going to pass it in data set dot tables DB properties then I'm going to reset my table name to my new table and then I'm going to set it next to that and then I'm going to save that other table to it so that's how you can pull in multiple small tables and be able to pull that in Work for you guys? Cool. Now, he's telling me time's up. I'm telling you, I still got two minutes to rush through something. <laughs> I still do have two minutes, don't I? Okay, cool. Oh, okay, so real quick, let's get into, into some bulk load rules as fast as we can. No, not from the beginning. That's fine. You guys can see that thing again. Now, there's a difference between bulk load and minimal logging. Everybody thinks those two are synonymous, but really you have very limited control over the logging when you do bulk loads. Um, so why don't you have control? Because you, by default, this is all by default, you have to have no indexes, uh, and the table must be empty if you do have indexes, and you only have minimal logging if new pages are created. So if you've got, uh, if you're doing a bulk load and you're not creating any new pages because you've already got pages allocated, then guess what? It's going to be fully logged. If you want to know why, I can explain that afterwards. Um, but it's pretty self, it's not self-explanatory, but it's pretty easy uh, to understand if you, re if, if you realize why, right? Oh, and as a matter of fact, I, I uh, explain it right here. So when you guys go back and watch the tape, then you can read this slide. You can pause it and read this slide. Um, now. Daybus must obviously has to be in bulk load or simple uh, in bulk log or simple mode, and bulk load option uh, operations can be part of a transaction and they can be rolled back as long as it's part of that transaction. As long as you haven't committed that transaction, you can roll back a truncate table. Try it. Do uh, an open transaction and then do a truncate table without committing it, and then roll it back. It rolls back just fine. So yes, they can be part of a transaction and they can be rolled back. Um, heaps don't get bulk logged unless you use tab lock, um, whether you have uh, trace flag 6.10 or not. So trace flag 6.10 allows you to have bulk load operations when there's a clustered index, right? Um, so uh, even if you have trace flag 6.10, if your heap is an index, it won't get minimally logged. Um, if the right execution plan isn't chosen. And this is where I say you have very little control, next to no control over your logging, because you can have everything in place, and if you have an index and it doesn't choose the right execution plan, it's still going to do fully logged. There's just nothing you can do about it. You can suggest, hey, if you feel like it and all of the planets line up, would you mind minimally logging this operation for me? But other than that, I've had plenty of these things that I thought were being minimally logged but I was getting the wrong execution plan and it was being fully logged. So if you want that, if it's really important to you, then you're going to have to ETL this thing and drop all your indexes and put them back, right? So use uh, 610 to do things, uh, trace flag 610 to do your bulk loads with indexes, right? Which means if in our previous script, if we were doing 
uh, if we wanted a bulk load there, right, and we want it to be minimally logged, we would have to in, we would have to uh, call trace flag 610, DBCC trace on 610, comma negative one for all the connections first, then do the bulk load, then turn it back off. So we'd have to open up a connection, right, with probably invoke SQL command because it's the easiest. Turn on trace flag 610 globally, because once we disconnect, that's gone, right? It has to be global because now we've got a new connection that's going to use that global setting and then turn it back off. Does everybody get that? And here are some rules here. If the table has data, you have to use trace flag 610 if it's empty. Um, you can use uh, tab lock and order by. You, ha um, you have to use tab lock and order by. You have to order it by the clustered index, right? So the, the query itself, the data has to be coming in in the same order as the clustered index. Um, and then you're going to have a lot of tempdb, uh, a lot of tempdb activity there while it uses it as a sort, right? And then some practical advice I've got here that we're are, are they including all of these materials in the thing? They probably are, right? You don't know. You're just the filmer. Okay, fair enough. Um, so uh, practical advice. I know I'm going a couple minutes over, but they'll live. Um, uh, this is all about point in time recovery. I get this a lot, but you don't understand. We have to have point in time recovery and we can't have bulk loads. We have to fully log everything. Okay, then don't bitch to me about, not, about, your, about your data loads being slow, right? The point is, everybody thinks their data is special. Your data is not special. Your workload is not special. Your database is not special. Your business isn't special. Yours is the same as everybody else. It's just bits and bytes, right? You got to give a little to get a little. If you want the data to come in really fast and you're pulling in 30 million rows, guess what? You got a bulk load. Period. You have to bulk load. If you don't want, if you're afraid of the bulk load, then do a then do a uh, a log backup before, a log backup right after. Make it part of your process because. Um, like I said, you can't really control that, right? And you, you can still have point in time recovery when you're in bulk log mode. Did you know that? The only thing is if you have any bulk load operations in that, in that log backup, that's when you lose point in time recovery. But if your entire database is in bulk load, is in, is in bulk log mode, if you don't have any bulk operations, you can still do point in time recovery. Being in bulk log mode does not kick that out. Only bulk operations do. So you can keep your database in bulk log mode, right? And only and, and then take special log backups when you want to do before and after your, your bulk mode operations so that you can get your point in time right after that. Okay? There's more here. Um, oh, there's the there's the uh, the speech on you guys not being special. And then there's some more here. They're going to put all these stuff up, and if they don't, I will. Okay? So we didn't get through a couple slides, but there you go. That is loading data into SQL. That's the best I can do in an hour and a half, and I even had to skim over some of that. Um, I hope I give you guys what you wanted, but remember, I'm a new speaker. I've never done this before, so take it easy on me. That's all I have. <laughs>